morning. I want to welcome everybody. TBI is hosting the Journal Club today, and it's going to be on cervical arthroplasty. And we have an all-star lineup. We have some guests that are going to be here to discuss some of the articles with us. So uh, I welcome everybody. What I'd like to do is start with a little intro as to why I think that cervical disc replacement is the new gold standard. I'm going to go very, very quickly, uh, but nonetheless, it will be recorded so you can go back and look at it at a later date. Ashley, let's see. Okay, so anterior cervical fusions have long been considered to be the gold standard, but now with all the IDE studies, many have begun to suggest that the new gold standard may well be cervical disc replacement. There are eight completed FDA trials for cervical disc replacement. They were all prospective randomized. There were one level trials and there were also two discs having two level trials. And currently in the US, we see that there are eight approved discs. The three in red have already recycled out of the system because they're outdated. And if we look at the pipeline, we see that the Simplify will be the next one to come down the line. And then we see the others that are also undergoing various stages of approval for their FDA studies. Cervical arthroplasty publications are hot, as you can see in the graph here. And all single level trials found that this replacement was non-inferior to ACF and superior on some measures. And the results have been maintained up to 10 years with long-term follow-up now available for three of the discs. The results are uniform, as we see the NDI scores for both the TDR and the ACDF out to 10 years. And we see data from other countries. Although the numbers are smaller, the results are essentially the same. There have been no indication of less favorable outcomes with the anterior uh, disc replacement compared to fusion. In 2018, there were seven meta-analyses that showed that either the disc was superior to ACDF, there's a lower reoperation rate, and it was less costly than doing a fusion. We also had 10-year follow-up, as I mentioned previously. We had the 10-year follow-up of the Bryan disc that showed a higher rate of reoperation for fusion uh, versus that of disc replacement, and then range of motion was maintained. The Brian disc is no longer available, but we also have 10-year follow-up for the Prestige LP and the Moby C one and two levels, and both found that there were lower reoperation rates, the motion was uh, maintained, and there was no indication of device failure at 10 years. So what this shows us is that this technology is safe and effective through 10-year follow-up. When looking at non-randomized observational studies with the randomized control trials, there was really no difference between uh, the treatment effects. And if we look at the range of motion, because people say, well, does it maintain the range of motion? We see here in the seven-year follow-up of all the different discs and even the 10 years that's been reported, it does indeed. Now, the real question, however, does it prevent a segment, adjacent segment degeneration? And the literature generally supports this, although not all studies do. And we'll look at some of these. In this meta-analysis of over 3,600 patients, they found that the pool data corroborated that the TDR was efficacious in preventing ASD. And we see in the MOBI-C study, the uh, lower number of adjacent segment surgeries in the one and two level versus the one and two level fusions. We also see in the seven-year follow-up of nearly 600 patients, again, with the TDR having about one-third to one-half the rate of reoperations compared to the fusions. But not all data supports that um, it does prevent it. And some data, as we see here in these papers, suggest that ASD is related to just the natural history. Reoperations are really important because they reflect the device safety and the failure and affect the outcomes as well as the cost. And we had done our uh, study that Scott was actually primary author on, uh, looking at all of our TDRs and ACDS with an average follow-up of four and a half years and found that our reoperation rate for any reason was 8% versus 21 for the fusions. And that was significant with the p-value of 0 0.05. 
Again, the MOVIC trial for subsequent surgery rates at five years showed that, again, there was far less reoperations in the disc replacement compared to the fusions. And this is a meta-analysis that we're going to discuss later. Again, showed a lower secondary rate of surgery, uh, and this was out of thousands of patients. Now, reoperation rates have been reported in other studies, but no case was there a higher reoperation rate with the disc replacement compared to fusion. But not all is rosy. We have problems of, or not problems, but we see heterotopic ossification that may not affect the clinical out outcome, as well as osteolysis. The reported rates of HO go up as high as 85%. And there's many factors that may affect it, but we don't really know for sure why it occurs. In this meta-analysis, we see that the uh, rate of HO increased up to two to five years, and then at five to 10 years seemed to stabilize for the uh, moderate cases, and, but the severe cases showed that it did increase. So it is fairly prevalent. We see with the Brian disc, or in this study uh, with the uh, Brian disc, there's about 50% HO at a 94 months follow, but it didn't affect the clinical outcome. So if you have severe HO, it's nothing more than a fusion and the fusions actually do pretty well as also. Now bone resorption or osteolysis is an issue. In most cases, it's really nothing more than what you see in the x-rays on the right, just resorption of the anterior spurs. But in some cases it can cause implant loosening and could lead to failure and the causes are wear debris, micromotion, stress shielding, infection, and C. acnes has now raised its, uh, its head, unfortunately. And HO and osteolysis can occur with any implant. We see them with all the artificial discs, just like our total joints. Cost, the TDR is less, than, uh, less expensive than a fusion in all of the papers except for one model. There's some additional issues, and this has to do with the end plate size and how they measure the height and the materials. And in this study, they showed with the ProDisc that the vast majority were too small, there were some that were too large, and those that in the middle were just right. And this can affect the load and can affect subsidence and also affect the joints. Also, the height of the disc is very important. And in this paper that came from Beijing, 36% were too high. And what this does, this distracts uh, the facet joints and unfortunately, each artificial disc is different in its shape and also where the height is measured from. So a five does not equal a five all the way across the board. Materials are also very important. And we see with a cobalt chrome prosthesis, there's terrible artifact on the MRI scan, making it useless. Whereas with this peak on ceramic, you can get a beautiful MRI scan. So in summary, the TDR is a mature technology, and we now see with our 10-year follow-up that the results are similar or superior to fusion, may, and it may protect against adjacent segment disease, and is associated with a significant low reoperation rate. And have we ever seen such strong academic data for a procedure um, like this in any area of spine? So this replacement may well be the new gold standard for painful degenerative cervical conditions or herniated disc. So with that, what I'd like to do is to turn it over to Joe Albano, who is going to give the first paper. And um, Joe, Ashley, you're gonna give it to Joe. And this paper, go ahead, Joe. Okay. Uh, so my name is Joe Albano, I'm one of the spine fellows at uh, Texas Back. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting on a paper today regarding the biomechanics of cervical disc arthroplasty, uh, by, uh, written by Dr. Putwardon, who is, uh, happens to be on our call today. So just by way of background, uh, cervical disc prostheses have historically been um, described uh, relative to their level of constraint. Uh, the, the historic terms were constrained versus semi-constrained, and that has to do with the degrees of freedom, those being flexion extension, lateral bending, axial rotation, uh, AP translation, lateral translation, and compression. Um, They've also been described by the uh, number of articulating components. Uh, and here's just a formula to um, determine those number of components. Uh, so looking at the three component uh, model, uh, one of those is the MOBC. This has uh, the most uh, degrees of freedom with respect to the three uh, component cervical disc replacements. The only thing it's lacking is, is compression because it, it can't compress through its solid mobile core. Uh, 
uh, but it can do all of the other motions. And so it, it has the, the highest uh, degrees of freedom. Um, other three component uh, cervical disc arthroplasties uh, allow for less degrees of freedom. The secure C, as you can see on the right here, allows for uh, AP translation because both the superior and inferior uh, components allow for flexion, uh, but there is no, um, there's no lateral translation. So it only has uh, uh, four degrees of freedom. And then we look at the two component prostheses. On the top, you see the, uh, the ProDisc implant, which allows for translation in the AP plane because of its mobile core in the AP uh, direction. Um, but then there are other, uh, the Dynacron uh, implant on the bottom right, the um, uh, saddle joint on the left, and the, uh, the ball and socket with the prestige in the middle, all allow for varying uh, degrees of freedom and uh, allow for uh, variable range of motion. Uh, and then the, the kind of newer generation, uh, although the, the top left demonstrates the Bryan disc, which was one of the first discs uh, uh, allowed in the United States, a lot of these newer models allow for uh, compression and so therefore all degrees of freedom. You, know, you see the M6 in the top right and the ESP and the Ryan on the bottom. Um, and they all have different mechanisms to allow for built-in resistance to angular and translational motion, so you don't have too much range of motion. So looking at the kinematics of the uh, healthy cervical spine, looking at the C5-6 level, because it is the most mobile, uh, flexion extension, you typically get about 16 degrees of, of, uh, of flexion and extension, lateral bending, uh, about four degrees of uh, motion, axial rotation, about five and a half. Um, but it's, uh, it's not inclusive to look at these uh, motions in isolation because all of these motions uh, occur with, with a couple. So for example, side bending occurs with a modicum of, of uh, uh, rotation. Uh, flexion and extension occurs with a modicum of uh, anterior and posterior translation. Um, and so the, the struggle with these discs is to incorporate these um, combined ranges of motion, these combined motions, uh, instead of just looking at individual motions. So looking at the, the rotation of at center of rotation for the different planes, um, the flexion and extension uh, center of rotation occurs at the, inf uh, the inferior, the superior aspect of the inferior body. Uh, and that goes more cranial in the lower you go down in the cervical, um, the cervical uh, spine. The lateral uh, center of rotation actually occurs in a plane that goes from posterior superior to anterior inferior. And that the center of that is actually, you can see in figure C here um, uh, for um, uh, the, uh, the lateral side bending. Um, but this inst the instantaneous center of rotation varies depending on uh, the, patient, the patient's physiology with respect to the, the healthy segment of the disc. In other, in other words, if the disc is uh, relatively collapsed, there's, there's increased or decreased translation relative to uh, those ranges of motion. So the study looked at a bunch of different um, uh, implants and uh, the, the range of motion that were allowed for by these implants relative to the, the, uh, the, the discs that are out there. Um, and so what we found is there's, uh, in this paper found a 37% decrease in lateral bending. And that's consistent with the literature. The literature shows a between 40 and 60% decrease in lateral bending for a variety of reasons. Um, there's a 27% decrease in axial rotation. Interestingly, many of the um, implants allow for physiologic flexion and extension. Dr. Geyer's paper uh, showed that about the ProDisc implant um, in uh, a few years ago. And so why is that? Uh, one of the reasons uh, we suspect is that the, the center of rotation uh, for an implant is different than that of a disc because the center of rotation is, is, is lowered inferior relative to where it should be. Uh, you see that the flexion and extension um, center of rotation is, is decreased. Uh, by uh, a small amount, but the later, uh, lateral center of rotation is decreased almost an entire vertebral level uh, lower to that. And, and that uh, has to do with some of the decrease in range of motion that you see. Uh, and so looking at that anatomically, what happens is because you're lowering the center of rotation, you actually uh, impart some uncinate impingement. Um, and, uh, and this uncinate impingement could in theory lead to further degeneration and pain down the road. Uh, you can also see some decrease in flexion and extension if the implants aren't functioning properly. For example, if there's uh, if the uh, the mobile core sticks or is not moving properly, you won't get uh, the full flexion that was intended by the implant. If there's some motion at the uh, implant bone interface, you'll get either increased or decreased range of motion um, uh, relative to what it should be. Another uh, aspect that the this paper looked at was the kinematic signature. There's this so-called uh, 
neutral zone in the middle here, which allows for a high degree of motion um, relative to a, a moment placed on it. Uh, when you go to the extremes of that an extension or flexion, the soft tissues uh, strain and allow for decreased motion. Um, on the right graph here, you see this is the, the red is the normal um, uh, motion imparted by um, the uh, uh, a, a normal disc. And if it's totally destabilized, you can see a more linear trajectory implying that there's just no resistance there. And so you want to try to maintain this as healthy of a, a balance as you can. When you look at the M6 implant in particular, what you see is that relative to the normal um, native disc, uh, the M6 actually does allow for a similar kinematic signature uh, to a normal disc. Notwithstanding, you still do see uh, about a 40% decrease with lateral bending. Um, and, and part of the, that reason is that the uh, implant may, uh, the end plates may touch and, and, and preclude uh, the total range of motion. So some surgical factors to consider when uh, trying to optimize range of motion. Uh, a slight positioning just posterior to midline has been shown to uh, uh, maximize these uh, range of motion. Uh, it was shown that the resection of the PLL was, uh, uh, did not affect the total range of motion with respect to um, uh, flexion and extension. Uh, one thing that has been shown to decrease motion is if you put too big of a disc in. Uh, Dr. Part Wardon also wrote another paper showing that uh, though even in discs with a preoperative height of three millimeters are though amenable to uh, cervical disc arthroplasty. Uh, an uncident resection is an interesting one as well. Sometimes we take down some of the uncident when we're doing a foraminotomy and uh, it's been shown that if you take down one uncident, it actually does increase flexion and extension. But when you start going into both considerably, it does confer some instability. So some conclusionary points that the um, uh, paper wanted to drive home was that translation does allow spinal anatomy to dictate segmental motion. And this, this concept of uh, uh, coupling of motion is important to, to consider when designing these implants. Uh, some of the newer prostheses with these built-in resistance me mechanisms to angular and translational motion will restore stability in, in, uh, stability in, in even hypermobile segments. Um, and distraction of the prosthesis and placement in the, in the correct planes um, do uh, are, are very important to optimize outcomes. You don't want to put too big of a disc and you don't want to uh, strain the tissue too much. So notwithstanding all of this information, uh, the question is which patients based on this biomechanical data should get these prostheses? Uh, what patients, uh, which prosthesis is the be best for hypermobile patients? And what anatomic consideration should you consider with respect to these patients, to each, each individual patient when considering what implant to, uh, uh, to, uh, 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 put in. So I, I leave that up to the panel to, uh, to kind of give their expert opinions on this. All right. Thank you, Joe. Well, we have uh, Dr. Pat Warden here and he's going to answer all those questions. But so Pat, you know, the real question is there are so many artificial discs out there. Should we get proficient at using one disc or is there a way for us to say, determine preoperatively what disc is better for what patient? I mean, I think that what happens, most surgeons get used to using a certain disc and that's what they use, or they might get used to using two discs. What do you think? Uh, yes, I think uh, my personal opinion, uh, and I have some data to back it up, is uh, depending upon preoperative assessment, uh, one can at least in theory uh, match the different discs to different uh, patient profiles. Uh, I don't know if it is uh, f uh, feasible, clinically speaking, uh, but certainly in the laboratory, you can make an argument that if it is a, if it's a, if the preoperative motion is too much, uh, but it's still indicated uh, prosthesis placement, then perhaps the prosthesis which, which offers some resistance to motion, like a cartilaginous joint rather than a synovial joint, is maybe better su uh, suited for that hypermobile preoperative patient. Okay. Listen, we have Rick Sasso here, and I want to ask Rick because Rick has been a pioneer with the rest of us in cervical disc replacement. Rick, do you uh, just use one or two discs, or what, what's in your armamentarium, and how do you decide what to do for what patient? Boy, Rick, it's a great question. The problem is we have really no data to support one disc over the other. What's amazing to me is that we have all these discs that look so much different from each other. The kinematics are completely different. 
the biomaterials completely different, the mode of fixation, initial fixation, completely different. But all of them, as, as, as you showed in your in, initial presentation, all of them show great outcomes. I mean, they do really, really well. So for me, I think, especially talking to a young surgeon, find a disc that you like, uh, find one that you are very comfortable with and stick with that one. Uh, because I think the, the more comfortable, the quicker, the, the better the outcome is, is going to be. If you can do, do that operation the most efficiently as possible, that's going to be the best for the patient rather than trying to use the next one, the best, the, the, the newest one out. So anyway, that's, those are my thoughts. And well, I mean, you know, you're, you're right, because if you look at the 10 year data, you know, that you were part of, and we have Matt Gornet that we're going to talk about his papers. Uh, it, it does make you wonder. So we have all these different artificial discs, different sizes, different heights, and it drives you crazy when you start analyzing them. And yet the data is so good. So either the cervical spine is very, very forgiving, or we need to follow these people out 20 years before we'll really notice differences. Another question, can I ask you? Can I ask a question? Sure. So, uh, if at 10 years we don't see any difference between the different designs, another possible reason could be that maybe we are not looking at the right, uh, right parameters. You know, Pat, I didn't, I didn't understand that. What, what did you say? Well, I mean, the, we are clinically are following uh, BAS, uh, NDI, and so forth. Maybe they are not sensitive. These parameters are not sensitive enough to the design differences in this disc, but that's also possible. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, well, listen, we have a very tight schedule, so we're gonna go on to the next paper. No, no, no. Rick, Rick, right. one, okay. I have one biomechanics question. I've always wanted to know this. All right, ask Pat. Do the facet joints get unloaded in the cervical spine, similar to the lumbar spine with certain models or not? I didn't see that answered in the biomechanics presentation by Joe Albano, which was fantastic, by the way, I learned a lot. So do the facet joints get unloaded? Just a quick answer, yes or no? That's why we have Pat. Yes, uh, they do get, in the lab at least, we see uh, the facet joints separated depending upon where you place the disc and the height of the disc relative to the uh, disc space. All right. So, yes. All right, now we're gonna do the next one. David, take it away. David's also right. one of our fellows. All right, I'm, I'm presenting two articles by Grenet et al. on the 10-year outcomes of single and two-level cervical disc arthroplasty using the Prestige LP cervical disc device. Um, let's see. Okay. The Prestige cervical disc is a dynamic device that is composed of two low-profile plates that interface through a ball and trough mechanism. The device obtained FDA uh, approval for single-level use in 2014 and for two-level use in 2016 for treatment in adult patients with intractable reticulopathy and or myelopathy of the cervical, cervical spine. The objective of these uh, studies were to assess the long-term safety and efficacy of the prestige cervical disc with up to 10 years post-operative follow-up for single and two-level cervical disc arthroplasty. Uh, the uh, outcomes at two, five, and seven years post-operative have already been uh, reported, which demonstrated non-inferiority of the cervical disc compared to ACDF at all time intervals. Uh, both studies are post-approval, multi-center, FDA-approved investigational device exemption clinical trials comparing CDA to ACDF, began in 2005 and 2006. The, uh, the single-level study is non-randomized, and it only evaluates the cervical disc arthroplasty arm of the original investigational study at 10 years, where the two-level study is, uh, not, is randomized and does compare the 10-year outcomes of cervical disc to patients undergoing ACDF at the same time intervals. The uh, primary endpoint was overall success, which is a composite variable requiring all five of the following criteria. Uh, next, uh, neck di disability index score, improvement of greater than 15 points, maintenance or improvement of neurological status, no decline in anterior or posterior functional spinal uh, unit, no serious adverse events caused by the surgery or the implant, and uh, no additional surgery at the uh, index level. Additional safety and effectiveness outcome measures were also included. Uh, the single level study, which again was not compared against the 10 year ACDF outcomes, had good follow up of 83% of the original arthroplasty group, but only 64% uh, had outcomes that allowed for evaluation of disc heights. So, therefore, uh, results are reported as patients with and without uh, disc height measurements. The two level study also had good follow up uh, in both the arthroplasty and ACF group of 85 and, and 86%. 
overall success for the uh, single level uh, study uh, for patients without disc height measurements maintained relatively stable at 74% over the 10 year postoperative course. And the rate of overall success for patients without disc height uh, remains stable up to five uh, years, then declined at seven to 10 years at 53%. Uh, Two-level octopasy demonstrated statistical superiority for overall success compared to ACDF at all uh, time intervals. Uh, NDI success for single level was maintained over the 10-year uh, course for two levels, uh, for, for single level and for two levels, it was statistically superior uh, as well. And neurologic success was also maintained in single level at 10 years and again, statistically superior at uh, 10 years in the two-level arthroplasty uh, group. Uh, disc high success was stable in the single level until seven and 10 years, but 41% uh, of the original study was unable to be measured for this uh, outcome. For uh, two level, disc height was maintained in both groups with no statistical differences between the ACDF and, uh, and uh, disc arthroplasty group. As far as uh, secondary surgeries for uh, the single level additional surgeries at the index and adjacent levels increased to 10 and 13.8%. Uh, serious adverse events during this uh, same time period also increased to 7.8 percent. For the uh, two-level uh, group, two-level study, uh, surgery, the rates of additional surgery were uh, much lower than the ACF group at the index level of 4.7 for 17.6 percent. Although the, uh, if you take out the elective hardware removals out of the ACDF group, uh, it was uh, still significantly lower with the uh, arthroplasty uh, group. And then. Uh, Serious adverse events were also much lower in the two-level group, 3.8 versus 8.1%. In regards to uh, patient report outcomes, the preoperative to postoperative improvements in NDI, neck pain, arm pain, SCF36 were maintained at 10 years with minimal changes in, in both studies. The average angular motion in both studies was also maintained without creating hypermobility throughout the 10 years. Uh, unfortunately, so uh, to summarize, at 10 years, patients with single level cervical disc arthroplasty remained consistent with seven year data. Unfortunately, these were not compared to uh, ACDF uh, arm of the study at 10 years um, as other as prior studies had been. Overall success was maintained at 10 years. Again, this was without uh, consideration of disc height measurements uh, as this was unattainable in many of the uh, patients. Uh, but there's no decrease in patient reported outcomes and patients neurological function remained uh, stable. With the two-level arthroplasty, at 10 years, it was non-inferior compared to ACDF on all effectiveness uh, outcome measures, and it was statistically superior to ACDF with overall success, NDI success, neurologic success. Um, and even though these two studies do not compare single versus two-level outcomes directly, it is interesting that the patients with the two-level surgery seem to have a higher rate of overall success, lower rates of secondary surgeries, and serious adverse events compared to uh, single-level uh, patients in that study. In fact, uh, this was compared at, at seven years, um, one versus two level outcomes, which demonstrated similar improvements and safety profiles. Um, this is also consistent with other long-term outcome studies showing, uh, with, with, as well as this study showing uh, 10 year outcomes of the Brian disc with uh, overall success, serious uh, and decreased serious adverse events in the adjacent level surgery compared to ACDF group. So as Dr. Geyer uh, mentioned, one potential uh, of dysarthroplasty is reduced adjacent segment disease. However, reports of incidents have been inconsistent. Incidence of adjacent segment disease was not included in this study protocol. However, rate of secondary surgery adjacent segments was reported. But what does this say about rate of adjacent level of disease with dysarthroplasty long-term? Um, <clears throat> and also dysarthroplasty patients in general are much younger than uh, patients undergoing hip and knee replacements. Therefore, uh, disc arthroplasty must remain functional for 20 years longer than artificial hip and knee replacements. And so these studies do indicate that there is a low probability of implant failure at, at least 10 years postoperatively, but further investigation is needed to evaluate long-term outcomes. Okay, thank you, David. That was great. Well, we just happened to have Dr. Gornet here. Matt? Oh. Hi. Um. You there? Yeah. Can you guys? So Matt, the two levels seem to do better than the single levels. Not that the single levels did bad. Why do you think that is? 
Well, I think all the panelists would agree that I think when we did these studies initially, we're looking for patients. This is 2006. We're not sure who the ideal patient is. There may be a patient with disc degeneration at one level with a significant soft disc at another. That patient would probably fit the criteria originally for a cervical disc at one level, but then maybe they develop an earlier adjacent level failure. There's a problem. Um, and so I think there was probably a push to have more patients fit a single level. There's, there's many more patients that really have two-level disease, and I think it was a, it was a sweet spot that, that us could include our patients uh, in, and, and I think that the, it was a, probably a better match is, is the best way of saying it. And Matt, let me ask you a question. So I recently heard that MOBC has surpassed 150,000 implantations. The, the data from, the, from your studies is really excellent but the Prestige LP is just, it hasn't taken off. What do you think? Why? I think in large part because um, there was a delay in its launch, even though it was ahead of MOBC in, um, in its, its approval process, it was delayed uh, for internal reasons. I think at Medtronic while they were adjudicating different adverse events and making sure everything was appropriate. And then I think that delay is sort of materialized into a little uh, lower market uh, penetration. I, I think it will continue to move forward. Uh, Prestige LP is one of those that sits sort of in between first and second generation because it has all the parameters that Pat Ward suggested, which is coupled motion uh, with some translation. Uh, the reason why I like it now, and I've used hundreds of PCs, hundreds of ProDiscs, uh, is that um, it, it is very forgiving. So if you get a little bit of subsidence, which is the most humbling part of any disc replacement, it tends to allow that patient to continue to function uh, without locking the core, without having a problem. And its imaging properties are, are somewhat better um, than MOBC. With that being said, as we've all discussed, all these discs work fairly well. I think the biggest part of this paper, which is because it's really the only paper that I'm aware of with two level prospective randomized to cervical fusion is the adjacent level surgeries. And it's, I think it was 9% for the index level one or, or the other versus 17.9. And, and that makes a very, very strong case that we're mitigating these adjacent level problems. Now, uh, Rick, if I can interject I was gonna call on you, go ahead. And, and everything Matt said is absolutely true. I think the other thing that uh, propelled MOBC is the ease of insertion and that they had, they had tasked sales uh, crews to come out and really train the surgeons, but it's really simple just to insert. And so a lot of the, the physicians who are placing these just want to be able to throw it in there as fast as they can and be out. Or Prestige LP has a few more steps with the rail cutters and other things. We, we've streamlined those sets, but it's still a little more difficult to insert than a MOBC. So I think that's promoted um, the use of MOBC as well. But the biomechanics of that disc, I think, are subpar relative to the other discs out there, in my opinion. Jack, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to ask Matt and Todd, even though it's not, you know, it's a metal on metal disc, although I know it's a metal carbide and it's, it's not the same and, and a lot of serum ion studies were done. But do you think that's um, part of the reason why uh, surgeon acceptance is a little bit less than, than ideal? Do you think there's still some stigma for metal on metal? Uh, it's possible. I don't think we can really measure that. I think it's a, it's a lot of different things. Certainly that could be a marketing uh, statement from others to say that that's a problem. But to date, I've not seen any cases of osteolysis. We CT everybody at 10 years and we've not seen any of those problems. Um, you know, the grade three, grade four HL rates are stable starting at five years and are about 39% and they are maintained across the board. So I really think that um, uh, the disc replacements become more important as far as their mechanics, the more levels you put into play. One level is very forgiving, and I think that's why, Rick, you mentioned that the data is pretty uniform. But once you start to get to two levels, and then in, in our situations, we do three and four, uh, what happens is you need a forgiving disc. You need a disc that uh, can compensate, especially if you're a little off, there's a little bone issue. And in my hands, Prestige has been that way. Um, 
uh, we'll soon start M6 trials, so I'll see how that one works. But uh, we've done thousands of discs, and, and that's why I currently use the Prestige LP. Okay, great. Well, listen, we got to keep on schedule. So the next uh, article is going to be discussed by um, Jacob, one of our other fellows. Uh, I'm sorry, by, um, yes, by Jacob. I'm sorry, this is Bobby. No, who is it? Oh, no, I'm, I'm presenting. I'm just trying to figure out the area. Okay, that's right, that's right. Yeah, thank you to the Seattle Science Foundation for letting me present this article, and thanks to Dr. Chapman and Dr. Geyer for DJing this event. Um, we presented this article in terms of uh, efficacy and safety of disc replacement with anterior cervical discectomy infusion in the treatment of cervical disease and meta-analysis. This was a paper published this year in 2020 out of Beijing, China. Sorry, I'm looking for the arrows over there. Uh, no disclosures. So background looking at the paper, I mean, the traditional gold standards has been the ACDF um, as the main concern when doing that procedure, you worship, you concern, you're concerned for loss of the motion segment, whereas the total disc replacement was brought on in the idea of motion sparing. And ultimately one of the holy grails is to eliminate or at least substantially decrease the adjacent segment disease. This paper was a uh, paper that pulled together uh, 15 studies ultimately from 1990 to between uh, 1990 and 2019. And when they searched for keywords that were included in the study, it was anterior cervical discectomy infusion, disc replacement, disc implants, disc prostheses, as well as disc disease. Their inclusions were that it had to be a randomized control trial done on humans. Uh, the options of ACDF versus uh, arthroplasty in the setting of cervical degenerative disc disease and their outcomes, although not all were included in every study, were NDI success, reoperation, adverse effects, patient satisfaction, overall clinical success, and neurological success. And we'll get into this later, but they found over 900 studies that met some of that criteria. They did qualitative and quantitative analysis, which narrowed it down to about 137, and then narrowed it down further, 15 studies out of eight clinical trials. So in terms of the results, one of the uh, quantitative factors they looked at was overall clinical success rate. This was a quote unquote composite measure. It actually varied between studies included in the uh, paper, but they ultimately were able to pull together 2,300 patients, uh, 1,300 in the arthroplasty group and over 1,000 in the fusion group. And they found that the arthroplasty had superior results at two years and long-term follow-up, quote unquote. Another uh, endpoint they looked at was the NDI success rate. This was defined as improvement of over 15 points from baseline. Uh, slightly less patients in this pooled statistic, but they had 1,600 patients looking at uh, 950 patients in the arthroplasty group, 700 in the fusion group. And they found that the total disc arthroplasty group had a superior and more uh, often higher success rate than the fusion group. And then they defined Another category is neurological success rate. 2,300 patients, mostly arthroplasty patients, and they found that at two years, the arthroplasty group was superior. And then you look at other results like secondary surgery. This was a quote unquote composite measure, various whether it be for infection or adjacent segment disease, but they were able to pull 2,200 patients together and they found uh, both uh, at two years and long-term follow-up that the arthroplasty group did better. And then they also looked at patient satisfaction. This was a survey just from the patient side. They were able to pull together 2,100 patients and found that arthroplasty was superior at two years and long-term follow-up. And another uh, and last classification that they looked at was the adverse event. They found that there was no difference between the arthroplasty group and the fusion group in the 1,600 patients. These adverse events were defined as implant and procedural events, including dysphagia, dysphonia, infection, uh, thromboembolysis, as well as other things which they just mentioned as et cetera. So that was not blanketly defined. So a lot of this uh, study has a common theme, obviously, that the arthroplasty uh, patients have all done better, but there are some uh, questionable study selection, sorry, not election. So they narrowed it down from 937 to 115 to, one, to 15 studies based on those eight clinical trials. They didn't specifically uh, define their quantitative or qualitative uh, assessments that they used to narrow it down. They used uh, three different uh, study selectioners and uh, they defined their outcomes 
uh, I put here questionable outcomes because they weren't defined rather rigorously as, as their inclusion criteria, you know, mentioned things like reoperation rate, adverse events. Not every study had every single, every single one of those uh, inclusion criteria that they were defining or looking for. Uh, these, this meta-analysis doesn't necessarily look at age of patients. They're quoted as saying some trials had lots of follow-up, but they don't mention which ones and if they kept any of those out. And largely these studies are all uh, industry funded studies. And obviously as mentioned before, there is a difference in arthroplasty disc design. So something for discussion here, I mean, after reading this paper, you kind of think of, is an ACDF of the sigil remnant of the 20th century? Is it something like malpractice? Because this is what this paper makes it seem to be. But ultimately I think you can take away that arthroplasty being a newer procedure, you worry about safety and efficacy as well as patient satisfaction. And all of these studies at least do not show a inferiority to the fusion. I think that's the biggest takeaway. I think kind of when reading this, I think when kind of thinking about the fusion versus arthroplasty, I think it's just important uh, thing to remember that uh, the arthroplasty is motion preserving, not motion creating. And yeah, I know that can be even uh, discussed at an extent, but uh, that's just some of my takeaways. And I'm sure the uh, panel here has uh, some very good insight on this paper. All right, thank you, Jacob. Very good. Ashley, can we go to the panel view? All right. Jack, what do you think? You, you were like, you know, you've written a meta-analysis and I have my feelings about meta-analysis and I'm, Scott has his feelings. So what do you think about the quality of this one? Uh, you know, this one had some, some issues. It, it uh, didn't get final edited uh, appropriately. They, there are some misstatements in the body of it. Um, and a couple of the forest plots I thought were mislabeled. <laughs> they were contrary to what the, the data showed. So it, it could have been spiffed up a little bit better, but uh, you know, meta-analysis is really the cream of our scientific evidence. Uh, it's, it elevates our level 1B uh, multi-center prospect of randomized studies into level 1A by pooling all of this data and applying more stringent scientific analyses to that same enlarged data pool. So things like the risk ratio and the confidence interval, you can't apply to um, a single prospective multi-center trial, but you can once you make it into a meta-analysis. So it, it's really the best that we can do. And, you know, it's kind of funny uh, because we keep getting pushback from industry saying there's not enough data, we need more long-term. Uh, you know, nothing has ever been exposed to this level of scientific investigation. So here you've got meta-analyses of 2,000 patients stretching out over 10 years with the finest scientific um, uh, tools that we have to evaluate it. And people still say, yeah, you know, but, but what if? Um, you know, there is a study from Sweden that disputes all this that says that neurologic success is better with ACBF, but, but that's a small voice when you have this big global uh, database saying something different. And, and the last statement I'll make before we open it up is, um, I think all of us get a little, little tired of hearing people say these are industry funded so that they're biased. Those of us who have participated in FDA studies know how many levels of oversight there are and what the penalties are for um, not being truthful, basically. Uh, they're pretty significant. So as a taxpayer, I was actually really happy when I first started participating in FDA studies because this data is much cleaner than um, typically comes out of a single institution uh, where people can kind of fudge a little bit. You can't fudge with the feds. Uh, because the penalties are the same as not paying your income tax. Um, and none of us wants to risk our career for uh, polishing up data. And then when you start overlaying data from all the sites and it's always exactly the same, unless you believe in a worldwide conspiracy um, that should really uh, take care of those objections. So um, Jacob did a very nice job summarizing that. And, and Rick Geyer, thank you for asking me to discuss a paper I had nothing to do with. <laughs> No, but, but it's interesting, Jack, because there are so many meta-analysis. I mean, I showed that one slide in 2018, there were seven meta-analysis. Like how many meta-analysis do we need to finally make the point? And as you said, it, it's ridiculous. I mean, this is good technology. No, it's not for every single patient, but it's proven technology. And now I think we just have to refine it. And uh, it's sort of a segue into our last paper, unless there's some other questions. I have a good comment. Or Matt, go ahead. I was just going to ask a question. Maybe this is not the right time, Rick, but 
given the overwhelming data, and I agree with what Jack said, I mean, it's, these are patient-derived outcomes. So the fact it's industry-sponsored, the patient is filling out the form, not the industry. So I think that has to be very clear. Finally, when do you think we're going to get three and four levels, at least group insurance approved? Because the data is so overwhelming that, uh, that it's a benefit uh, it's hard for me to understand the reluctance of that. Uh, and maybe that's not the right time for this, Rick. Uh, Rick, you can hold that question till after the next paper if you think that's appropriate. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's something that bugs all of us. But why don't we go on and discuss the last paper? And this is on osteolysis. And uh, it's going to be discussed by Bobby Stockton. Hi, everybody. Um, since we've discussed uh, so many good things about cervical disc arthroplasty, we have to introduce a complication. So this is a paper that was accepted in August 2020 in the European Spine Journal on osteolysis after cervical disc arthroplasty. So osteolysis reported complication after cervical disc arthroplasty. Um, up until this point, it has been rarely discussed, but it's pretty well understood that uh, patients can have some complications neurologically, clinical deterioration, and they can even develop some deformities, kyphotic deformities. The etiology is unknown at this point, but it's likely multifactorial. Patients, um, for the most part, are asymptomatic, but like we discussed previously, they can develop some symptoms, which we'll get into. And uh, the goal of this review article was kind of just compile data and so try to determine the, um, the level of incidence, the etiology, and consequences of developing this osteolysis and try to discuss some of the treatments that um, are being utilized. So, like I said, a systematic literature review using strict PRISMA guidelines. Um, the keywords used were cervical uh, and arthroplasty and osteolysis or bone loss in these four uh, search engines, PubMed, Google Scholar, Web of Science, and Medline. The studies included discuss the incidence, characteristics, the risk factors, and some uh, discussed management of symptomatic patients. So total of nine studies were included. There was one prospective randomized single center study and uh, five retrospective case series. These six studies were grouped into a large case series of mostly asymptomatic patients for radiographic evaluation of osteolysis and trying to kind of discover a classification scheme. Um, they also include three case reports of symptomatic patients, um, just to kind of highlight the revision surgeries that were utilized to treat the situation. So from the study, um, about 40 to 60% of cases developed some sort of osteolysis. Um, there was one outlier study, Kim et al. reported only 8% of their patients had developed osteolysis. Kaiser reported the significance with MOBI-C um, in that it developed the most anterior bone loss when compared to the Brian, DiscoServe, and the Baguera C. Um, and each of those groups had roughly 40 patients. Um, there's no difference in the incidence of bone loss between the upper and lower adjacent levels. However, the upper adjacent level seems to have more mild or moderate bone loss when compared to the inferior level, which has some severe bone loss. Um, most of these cases are asymptomatic. Um, all of the larger series that were included were all asymptomatic patients. And even with the severe radiologic bone loss, they were asymptomatic. Uh, Hacker reported a 5.3% incidence of symptomatic osteolysis, which was one of the studies included in that larger series. Um, and <clears throat> most of these authors in this study in particular were reporting osteolysis that developed in less than one year from their index surgery. Um, However, in the case reports, a lot of patients were developing osteolysis even after four or five years. And here at Texas Back, we're seeing patients develop osteolysis after a year as well. So this slide I just included to kind of highlight um, the surgical treatments for the symptomatic patients in these case reports. Um, Hacker had two patients, one with migration, one with osteolysis and HO. Both um, were revised with ACDF. Interestingly, their osteolysis patient needed a revision from their two-level ACDF because the graft subsided. So that's something to look out for and it's something uh, you need to be cognizant of when revising these osteolysis patients. And that patient required a corpectomy and posterior spinal fusion. 
Um, and the rest of the patients were pretty much ACDF or corpectomy. Um, and one patient they treated with unilateral posterior cervical foraminotomy with a posterior uh, one level fusion. So many ways to skin the cat. So th this uh, article in particular focused on the discussion of etiology. Um, they talked about four causes, one being infection. And here at Texas Back, we're kind of seeing a C. acnes type indolent infection that is causing this osteolysis, which they discussed in their article as well. Immune mediated processes such as my metal hypersensitivities might increase macrophage resorption of bone and osteoclastic uh, activation. Thermal injury, which I was unaware of that the uh, bovi or cauterization anteriorly can upregulate osteoclast activation and cause bone resorption. And in this paper, they discussed that the loading force or stress shielding is likely the culprit of the anterior uh, bone resorption. Um, and they tried to just go over some sort of treatment algorithms, but they didn't discuss too much of it. There was one table included. Most of the patients are being observed. Um, if they have mild or moderate uh, bone loss, they are treating them non-operatively, in a collar sometimes. Um, but the revision surgery um, mostly indicated for your severe asymptomatic osteolysis and your moderate symptomatic osteolysis. So in conclusion, I think this study is kind of uh, the first um, study that kind of opens this floodgate of osteolysis. So the number of publications regarding osteolysis after cerebral disc arthroplasty are lacking up to this point. It's something that we're kind of seeing now after years and years. Um, the heterogeneity of the studies included in the review are uh, an issue as well. Plus the quality of the studies are all retrospective. It's probably level three, four, and five evidence, but they used what they had, which I think is important. Um, some of the takeaways, um, the etiology may affect the timing of this osteolysis because in this paper they discuss uh, osteolysis occurring uh, within one year of their index procedure, but we're seeing patients that are presenting with osteolysis even three years and four years after their index procedure. So the etiology will, is probably um, causing different timelines for these patients as well. Um, take home point, we need to follow these patients closely with x-rays every six months up to a year. And then at least every year they should have x-rays done. And we need to get to the bottom of this. So we need to not create, recreate the wheel. Um, the total joints guys in orthopedics have done a lot of research in osteolysis. And it, instead of just starting from scratch, maybe we need to run this by our colleagues that can maybe share some strong insight into what we're dealing with and they know about these metals and the polys and all that stuff. So I think that's very important. Um, every revision, we need to take cultures and multiple cultures because we're seeing these indolent C. acnes infections. And we need to tell the, uh, the lab to hold these cultures for 21 days um, because these indolent C. acnes infections can take a while to culture if they even culture at all. Um, be interesting to test patients for hypersensitivities. Patients can develop new allergies. So that would be interesting. And um, just critiquing our immediate post-op imaging, looking at the shell angle, it was reported that a over five degree shell angle can actually lead to anterior bone loss, probably from the stress shielding effect. Um, so I'll open it up to discussion. I know Dr. Blumenthal is really happy. Bobby, that was great. Analysis. Thank you very much. And uh, a great analysis and great summary. So uh, Scott, you, you, you've seen more of the osteolysis than any of us, at least at TBI. So uh, what are your comments? So you know, I just have a, a couple comments, one specific to this article and one <clears throat> kind of general to this journal club itself. Um, this, uh, we've, we fast-tracked this paper. It's accepted for publication in the European uh, Spine Journal. And uh, I, think, I think Rick helped review it. I, I'm the editor for meta-analyses and reviews, which means I'm the low man on the totem pole because most of them are pretty crappy. And this actually isn't that great a study because of the heterogeneous nature but well, we thought that it should get out there, you know, as Bobby said, to at least start the discussion because the osteolysis, is, it's, it's such a, it's just not one etiology. There are mechanical reasons as the papers indicated, but the one that's of concern now in relation to 
um, kind of this emerging literature on biofilms on orthopedic and spinal implants is something that we really need to start paying attention to. Um, the, as, as, the, as we're accumulating cases um, at, at TBI, and albeit most of these cases are people that got sucked in to go to Europe for medical tourism, we seem to be seeing it more frequently in the, in the load sharing disc, which is the, the ESP disc, which isn't available in the US, uh, and the M6. And our negative experience at this point is 100% culture rate positive for C acnes. So whether you know it's it's a materials issue, likely I don't know, mechanical I, I, I doubt. Um, but I mean it, it's something that uh, we need to to look into when we're looking. And as as we all talked about earlier, um, selecting the discs that we're going to use in these patients with multiple selections out, you know, now FDA approved. Um, my, my other comment, and I'm, I'll yield to Matt in a sec. My, my other comment is, uh, this is, a, a, this is a promotional, is we just completed a, a focus issue at European Spine Journal on cervical disc arthroplasty to, to really discuss that issue of gold standard as Rick alluded to at the beginning of his talk and Rick and Jack, and I think even Pat Warden's uh, all I'll have papers in, the, in this uh, issue that's coming out in, in a month or two. Matt. Matt. Uh, my question was, to me, in the total joint world, there's a difference between stress shielding and loss of bone density versus osteolysis, which is usually a macrophage response secondary to particle disease. And at least in my novice experience, they separate those two. This paper seemed to lump everything together where if you had anterior loss of bone or remodeling, to me, that's a very different um, animal than osteolysis. And maybe someone else could comment on that or whether they separated those two. No, they didn't. And that's the weakness of the analysis. They, they are two separate issues because yeah. you know we see stress shielding issues in all the discs. We seem to see the inflammatory issues more frequently in some of the discs. You know, th this brings up another question. And, you know, empirically, we have followed our patients on a yearly basis, but now even more so, I think with the cervical spine, we need to do it because we've had uh, a couple osteolysis, the severe osteolysis that need to be revised in our own practice, totally asymptomatic because the C acne is such an indolent infection. You know, there's just no way to detect it unless you get those long-term cultures that Bobby talked about. The other thing is the reporting. You know, Matt, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you hadn't seen any prestige LP osteolysis. Well, you know, I, I'm currently following a doc that had a two level. Now that's only one case. The question is, how does this get back to the company? Because our question is that, you know, we're seeing these osteolysis and I don't know why, I think because Scott's out there advertising for them. So they're all coming to TBI. But, <laughs> well, you know, we all have our stick. How does it get back to the company? Because you know, it reminds me years ago when I wrote a paper on hyper metal hypersensitivity in the lumbar disc replacement. Nobody else said they had any problems. I'm the only one that had two cases from one study from the Kineflex. When we started to gather cases from around the world, we found that there were 10 and they were all different discs. It was the, um, the Maverick, it was the uh, pro disc that was also involved with this metal hypersensitivity. So we're seeing things, but the question is, how do you convey that information universally so that everybody can be on the lookout or aware of it? Well, yeah, I think that failed osteointegration, which can create a level of osteolysis. There's a recent paper published that was just about uh, the uh, uh, osteo, uh, osteolysis occurring with Prestige LP. I just read it and I can't remember the author, but, but it would occur in the first few months and then stabilize and stop. In patients that I've followed, and I've had a few osteolytics with Prestige LP and others as well with, with ProDisc and all of them, frankly, where they've still had pain. When I've gone in and re-explored them, uh, usually there was one end plate loose, and I've cultured all those. Some have been positive for CACTI, some have not. Um, I've been talking to uh, at HSS and, and radiology because they're, they have a new MRI protocol to look for failed osteointegration that they use for joints. So we're trying to uh, I have the MRI protocols for that. I think we all might want to investigate that. Maybe I'll put that together and we can talk about a way to, to image failed osteointegration for 
these types of implants. And that's going to happen. It's, you know, we're going to have these issues. And then the question is, is do we revise to fusion or do you re revise to a different uh, disc and, and uh, continue with arthroplasty? Well, well, that's great, Todd. And that's good information for us to know because, you know, we need to cross fertilize. And as Bobby said, we need to take the information they have from the total joint, as you just told us, and incorporate in what we do. Listen, we're out of time, but I want to thank everybody. This was great. I want to thank our fellows. I want to thank all the the, the faculty that made the comments and uh, thank, you know, the panelists. So this was really terrific. Thanks, Rick. Uh, we haven't seen you for a while. You need to come back more often. And uh, Pat, thank you. And Matt, uh, come back, please. So hey, Rick. And I'm, I'm, I'm moving to Texas, you guys. So I think I'll, I'll just come join all you guys and bring my friends. Okay, well, that's great. Everybody can move it's to Texas. It's crazy here. It's just too insane here. I'm, I got to get out of here. How do we get a copy of the recording? Um, actually, actually, we'll tell you how to get a copy. All right? Thanks. Have a good all right, day. everybody, take care. take care. Thank you. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.